Okay, this is uh, the last lecture of this year's Nuremberg uh, lectures in uh, geometric analysis. Jensen is going to continue uh, his lecture uh, titled Recent Progress on the Kene Novas and Samanovich Conjecture and the Bogans Slicing Problem. Okay, Jensen, it's all yours. And thank you, and thank you, Pante, for the for nice introduction. And thank you, all the organizers, for kind of invitation. Um, yeah. Our, Alina asked me to speak some French, but yeah, I only know a few. <laughs> yeah, c'est un, un, un grand plaisir uh, d'être ici uh, à présenter cette uh, Nirenberg conférence uh, au Centre de Recherche Mathématique. Uh, Merci pour votre invitation. Uh, today, yeah, that's the few words I still remember, but it's, it's difficult. <laughs> today, I'm going to present some uh, the, the lecture two on the recent progress on the KLS conjecture and we began slicing uh, problem. And um, sorry, the, the lecture two will be like uh, divided in two parts. So we'll continue to discuss this uh, KOS conjecture problem and try to relate it to other uh, conjectures like Bougain slicing, slicing problem and Singshell conjecture that uh, Boas already presented. And then we'll try to finish the, the, the proof in our paper 2020 and present the proof ideas. And this will still follow the same idea of like using passwise analysis and like you you don't prove things on the original density, you just transform it and, and then prove things on the transform density. And then in the last part, I'm going to present some applications of this improved chaos conjecture and also the application, other applications of this um, passwise analysis or this Eldan Stogas localization and present some feature directions. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so the first part, the chaos conjecture, let's briefly go through it quick. Uh, yeah, like, like this. Uh, so since it's uh, there, we have, since we have, might have new audience today. Uh, so the chaos conjecture is about uh, the isoparametric coefficient of log concave densities. So we have to define these two quantities. Isoparametric coefficient of a density is, uh, you have a density here, for example, is the uniform distribution over a convex set like this. And then you, you partition the space into S and S complement. The isoparametric coefficient is the ratio of the boundary measure divided by the minimum of these two volume PS and PS complement. And then you take the infimum over all kind of uh, boundary measures, uh, all, no, all, all kind of partitions and take the, and you get the uh, isoparametric coefficient. So isoparametric coefficient characterize uh, actually how, whether this kind of uh, density has some kind of bottleneck. If the density is like roundish, like uh, uh, it, it like this, like uh, uh, then it should have large isoparametric coefficient because no matter how you partition it, you, your boundary measure is still quite, quite large. But if your uh, density has some kind of bottleneck, then like if you partition it like this way, uh, uh, this S and S complement like this, and then uh, the boundary measure in the middle becomes uh, very small. Okay. Um, then we have to define the log concave density. So public density is log concave is when you basically take the the log of this density. It is satisfied this concavity property. So the point in the middle, the value of the point in the middle is larger than the the average of the 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 two extremes. Um, so typical log concave density, Gaussian exponential logistic densities where it's the form e to the minus f with uh, f convex. And then you have a large class of log concave densities that is a uniform distribution over convex sets, uh, like proportional to indicator of these convex sets. Okay. Um, so the chaos conjecture says that uh, uh, it's like Conan Rovach and Simonovich in 1995 says uh, if there exists a universal constant C, the important thing is C does not depend on the dimension E n, ambient dimension n, 
so that you can bond, you can lower bound the isoperimetry coefficient by a constant c that divide by some normalization factors. Here, the normalization factors is exactly the square root of the spectral norm of the A uh, of the covariance matrix. Um, so uh, we'll explain why is this normalization. But, uh, so you, a few remarks, remarks. So for isotropic log concave density, if you normalize the density to, to have mean zero and covariance identity, then the lower bound is stated to be just a universal constant. So you do this basically, you do this normalization based on the covariance, okay? And um, another thing is that the upper bound for this isoparameter coefficient uh, is achieved by half spaces. So if you only consider those boundaries of, of the form hyperplanes, you, uh, you, will, uh, you will be able to uh, achieve a constant upper bound for this uh, isoparameter coefficient. And so you can see, so you can also see that the, the, the normalization is also based on like uh, how much you can get by like cutting this uh, partition in space using hyperplanes. Okay. Um, okay, so this chaos conjecture is kind of famous because it's related to several other conjectures. So this uh, uh, conjecture, uh, Boas explained a little bit, this uh, Stingshaw conjecture that, um, Antila Bo and uh, Perry Sinaki in 2003, they conjecture that for any isotropic log concave density, uh, we have this Stingshell constant, uh, Stingshell constant sigma p is less than uh, a constant. So it means that actually uh, the, the expected norm of x uh, for x randomly drawn from this log concave density. Uh, should concentrate around this ball, not, our, not just concentrate around this ball square root uh, n, but also in a stage thin shell around this, uh, this, this ball. And uh, as long as you normalize to be like mean zero and covariance identity. Okay. And so it's, it's easy to prove actually, if you try these things like with a standard Gaussian density, you can prove this uh, thin shell kind of results. And so it's basically saying like, uh, in the sense of the single constant, this type specific type of concentration, then the, the law, any log concave density with identity covariance, the, the mass uh, will concentrate very similar to the standard Gaussian. Okay. And to get the single, uh, to get the, uh, to get the single conjecture from chaos conjecture, uh, you just need to apply uh, Chigas inequality. You get a Ponga and kind of, this is basically like some kind of, you can try to bond it using some kind of Ponga inequality by choosing the function as a norm function. Uh, so you get a Ponga inequality from the isoparameter constant. So that one direction is easy, but the other direction is actually not trivial. It's proved uh, by Eldan uh, 2013 where it's the first paper the Eldan stochastic localization has introduced and will explain a little bit. So, uh, so the, the proof technique is again, actually what we discussed a little bit in this pathwise analysis. It's, it's a meta technique to study the properties of a high dimensional object. And you have three steps. The first step, you, 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 you introduce a process that transform your original high dimensional object. And then uh, you inspect whether there's special property after you do transform this high dimensional object. And uh, often there are some properties of this one transform the density that is easy to prove. And then you relate it back to like, try to, you want to prove some property as a high dimensional object, original one. And uh, you, you, you basically have to relate the, the properties of the original high dimensional object to that uh, uh, that transformed one. So let's see. Uh, so yeah, in the lecture one, we discussed like uh, you can see this convex localization or needle decomposition in the original chaos paper, 1995 paper as a pathwise analysis. Uh, you can also see this uh, L-dense stochastic localization in the uh, Mambala 2017 as, uh, as a pathwise analysis. 
And uh, actually, so in the in the Stinshaw conjecture implies chaos conjecture in the Eldance 2013 paper, uh, where this proof technique was introduced. It is also kind of passwise analysis, uh, but there's something like a slightly different than what we explained last lecture. So you still use the Eldance stochastic localization. Um, I would go into details if you didn't follow last lecture. Uh, uh, so with, uh, with some kind of control matrix identity and you early stop the process. And what you observe is actually uh, when you transform the density using Eldance stochastic localization, you add some Gaussian part. And when you add some Gaussian part, it's easy to prove some Poincare inequality. So it's easy to prove some kind of uh, uh, isoparametric inequality at time t. Uh, what you really want is like, you want to put the Poincare inequality for the original density for any like uh, test the function like Lipschitz function. And you can use this formula to relate some variance of the density at point at, 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 the, uh, at the original and the variance of the uh, density at uh, time t. And um, I'm not going into details about this calculation, but it's, uh, uh, the, the key idea is there. And this, this idea of this, yeah, Passive analysis or like introduce a process to transform your density and relate back this uh, the air dense stochastic localization. It really started in like 2013. Okay, there's also this, this conjecture, very famous conjecture is actually earlier than uh, uh, chaos conjecture, this Bugans slicing conjecture. It says um, that for any uniform distribution over a convex set, there exists a hyperplane section where its volume is at least a, a universal constant C. So it's saying that for any kind of convex set, you take a convex set. Um, here you don't constrain it to be isotropic. It's just like any kind of convex set. It cannot be like a, a very thin in all directions. You can find one direction that its section is very small, but you cannot be in every direction is section is small. As long as your volume is, is of order, yeah, the volume is of order one and then the, the hyper section is like, uh, cannot be like, cannot be all like very small compared to the volume, okay. And this, yeah, this is kind of a very geometric kind of uh, uh, representation of the conjecture. There's actually a more mathematical version of this conjecture that proved by Bohr in, uh, two, in 1988, uh, where he shows that uh, the Bugan slicing conjecture is equivalent to say that there exists a universal constant so that for isotropic log concave densities, the slicing constant, which denoted by LP, is basically the P to the at density at zero to the power one over uh, dimension is less than a universal constant. Um, so, so what, like, yeah, why is this, 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 how is this kind of uh, slicing constant used? Uh, where does this appear? It actually has a very kind of usual kind of uh, interpretation of this uh, slicing constant. It, it was proved in uh, uh, 2006 in, uh, uh, by Bao, that uh, the if you have a control on the slicing constant, you have control on the large deviation of the, the norm of uh, a, ran, uh, a random variable drawn from this log concave density. So x drawn from this isotropic log concave density p, uh, you have this type of uh, um, tail behavior for the norm of x and the slicing constant here appear here. So if the Slicing conjecture is true here will be an absolute constant. So that means the radius where you start to have this uh, uh, exponential tail uh, is the uh, square root of uh, square root of n will be that radius. And this will be very similar to what you have uh, when you deal with the Gaussian distribution. Um, okay, so the chaos conjecture as, uh, actually implies uh, the other two conjectures. So up to log dimension, log factors in dimension, uh, you have this uh, uh, 
we take the soup over all isotropic log concave densities and take the one over uh, KLS constant, take the super over the thin shell constant, take the super over uh, all uh, slicing constants over all isotropic log concave densities, you have this chain of inequalities. So the first part is to get the isoparameter inequality to the Poincare inequality, you just apply Chigas inequality. Well, the, the reverse is also true, but it's, uh, it's not trivial. It's proved by Erdan 2013. Um, so yeah, actually, maybe like the reverse is by Erdan. So then 2013. And then here, um, uh, the, this direction is also not trivial. This uh, from Sinshell to slicing, it was proved by Eldan Platak in 2011. And the proof technique using uh, this log logarithmic Laplace transform or like you, you tilt the measure, exponential tilting. Uh, um, it's also like, it's some proof technique Platak can, is very good and Boaz is very good. And can, maybe you can talk a few words in the end. Um, so the chaos conjecture implies initial conjecture implies slicing conjecture. So that's why like um, uh, people, yeah, many people focus on initial conjecture and also like focus on chaos conjecture. Um, so there are many bounds on the chaos conjecture previously. Uh, on the initial side, uh, Boaz mentioned many of them. So this, uh, the first kind of non-trivial bound for the Sinshaw constant started actually from this Boas paper in 2006, uh, where you kind of get a, a dimension to the one half, but uh, not just dimension to one, you can get better than dimension to the one half. And this constant has been improved uh, throughout the years uh, and was, uh, was at the end to the one third in 2003 by, uh, 2011 by Gedon Milman. So the thin shell constant implies uh, chaos conjecture. Uh, like I, we explained the LDAN 2013, basically using stochastic localization says that they are, they are close to just a log factor, log n factor. Uh, actually, there are pre previous work by Bob Kopp in 2007 where they're close in n to the one fourth factor. This So this is improved. So rough, now we know that this, the, all these thin shell con constants can be directly translated to KLS uh, constants. So uh, there are also papers trying to prove the chaos conjecture uh, directly. Um, so the, the, the KLS like 1995 paper and the localization idea we presented last time is, is one, it's also one type of pathwise analysis that gets you to end to the one half and Liam and Pala using Eldan stochastic localization idea get to the end to the one fourth. And so today we are going to present how do we get, so we use the same type of stochastic localization idea that we kind of have a refined analysis and we'll get something to the end to the log log n on over log n to the one half power since uh, uh, this this quantity, this log, log n divided by log n goes to zero when n tends to infinity. So you can see if, if n is large enough, uh, then this rate is kind of better than any kind of constant n to the alpha rate. Uh, but we don't, yeah, we don't prove a constant. We don't completely resolve the KLS conjecture. It's just uh, like, it's almost a kind of constant when n is large. Um, so here's the, like a brief timeline. So the, the chaos conjecture in 95, thing show in 2003. And you can direct, like people directly prove the KOS bond, uh, like uh, in, like in, in red, they're like n to the one half and one fourth and then to the little old to one. And there you can also translate those uh, bonds from thing show conjecture to chaos conjecture using Eldan stochastic localization and the, the, the paper, 2013 paper, and you get this. Um, okay, let's uh, get into a little bit more details and discuss uh, uh, what is uh, our proof idea in the 2020 paper. Um, yes, so this, this we have shown. 
So the key idea started with this LDANCE 2000 paper where you don't try to prove the isoparametric inequality directly on the original density. Uh, you want to transform it. And his attempt in transforming the density, uh, this, I, his intuition is to transform the density gradually by multiplying it uh, with the, some random linear function. So in this picture, we have seen that you start with some uniform distribution over a convex set. And then the first step you will do uh, F, F zero X times uh, one plus epsilon X transpose theta one. So you will pick a random direction and then put a little bit mass on the right-hand side and let diminish, diminish a little bit mass on the, on the left-hand side. And you can do this iteratively. You choose another in random direction and put a little bit mass on this side and less mass on this side. You transform your density. Okay. And the good thing about this kind of transformation is like you can do it uh, with the epsilon. So it's like you can make the epsilon 10 to zero and give uh, some kind of continuous process that transform your density and you can do some kind of stochastic calculus we'll, we'll discuss. And uh, another interesting thing is actually uh, when you multiply two random linear functions, you have a chance to make appear some Gaussian part in your density. And we, we know that if your density has some kind of Gaussian part, it becomes like strongly log concave and it's easy to prove as a parametric constant. So the idea is that if you have two random directions, it's, it's opposite, like one plus epsilon x1, one minus epsilon x1, then it's one minus epsilon square x1 square, which is roughly exponential to the minus epsilon square x1 square. So it's like roughly multiply your density by exponential to this minus x squared, which will give you uh, a, a little bit Gaussian part in your density and becomes it becomes strongly log concave. Um, okay, so this idea actually is formalized. Uh, like this idea of letting epsilon 10 to zero and make this process rigorous is formalized in this way. So you have an original density P log concave, and you have a process indexed by time t that at each time you multiply this p by uh, this quadratic e to the some quadratic function. Okay, that's the idea like getting in uh, multiplied by some Gaussian part. And what is this ct and bt? They are specified using this uh, stochastic differential equation here. So the bt here is simple like in this in the in last lecture, we have chosen this CT to be other matrix, but this lecture, we just choose CT to be identity. Then the BT is just a, a T times identity. So the, the Gaussian part like linearly increases here. Okay. And the intercept part actually is interesting that it satisfy a, a stochastic differential equation. It has a, like the Martingale part or it has a drifter part. Okay. Um, and why is this kind of specific construction? You can do the calculation and try to take the derivative of this PT. Um, when you take the derivative of PT, uh, you can see that the, the derivative of PT is just a, a random linear function like X transpose DWT times PT. Um, PT is the density at time T and this DWT is a Brownian motion. So it's like, the Brownian motion is now playing the role of like a random direction. So it's a linear function uh, and times the PT. So it's like related to his attempt to transform density. It's like at each iteration, you do, you, you add a PT uh, X by a little bit like linear, random linear function multiplied by original density. You add uh, it a little bit, okay. And this formalism actually has some benefit because now you can use, you, can, you know that uh, when you introduce this Brownian motion, you, you know that this PT is a martingale and you have some properties to control this, uh, this martingale. Okay. Okay. How do we use this LDAN stochastic localization? Um, so we started with some. So yeah, so, so you want to prove that the boundary measure of any set S 
is larger than the minimum of PS and PS complement, and we want to get the constant in, in, in front. Okay. And it is sufficient to start with the boundary is a uh, subset of measure one half for block concave densities. Uh, yeah, for example, you can see this Milman uh, 2019 paper. It explains it's because of some kind of uh, concavity of the idle parametric profile. profile. It's sufficient to consider all subsets, all partitions of measure one half. And once you have that, you do the boundary, you want to bond the med bond, lower bound in this boundary measure, and you don't bond this on the original density P, but you bond it on the transform density. So what is, does it mean? So first step, you will use some, there's a martingale property that PT is a martingale, so the expectation of PT equals to P uh, for any kind of boundary measure. And then at time T, we have seen that at time T, the Gaussian part increase linearly. So at time t, uh, this, uh, this pt will have like uh, e to the minus uh, tx squared over two, like times px, uh, this, this proportional to this type of density. And this type of density is like strongly log concave or like the, it, it has the Gaussian part. And we know how to bound this type of, we know how to bound the isoparametric coefficient for this type of density and is exactly the Gaussian part will appear as the isoparametric coefficient here, t to the one half. Okay. So we observe that uh, the, the, the transform density is easy to prove uh, isoparametric inequality. And then to get from the, the second line to the third line, we just uh, uh, trunc truncate the exp expectation of this minimum, this quantity. So as long as this PT S is uh, close to the range one half, uh, like this probability is bounded, we have control on this expectation of minimum this two quantity. And then since uh, this is just uh, one half, right? So base, we just, we basically have a boundary measure is larger than something times the minimum of this, uh, uh, these two measures. And what really matters is like this T here and this uh, PTS uh, high probability bond. So what does this mean? That uh, to, to, get the to get good isoparametric inequality from this L-dan stochastic localization, what you really need, you need to run this process long enough. You want this T to be large enough so that this quantity is large. But at the same time, you want to control this, this PTS because it's a stochastic process, it is changing. You don't want it, this PTS to be too close to zero because if it's too close to zero, then you, this side becomes zero, this side becomes zero. So you want to run the process long enough, but it kind of, the, 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 the PTS is changing, but you want to control that this, this is bonded. This is always close to one half, the starting measure. Um, so there's some kind of trade-off going on. You want to run the process long enough, but at the same time, you want the good control of this quantity. So uh, the interesting thing here is that you start with some um, isoparametric inequality, which is uh, it's like high dimensional and uh, geometric problem. Now you have an analytic problem. You have a stochastic differential equation very well defined. And this PTS fair has close form uh, stochastic uh, differential equation like definition and you want to control like uh, how what is the time t that you still have this control of this uh, uh, pts so let's take a look at this uh, this pts so what is this pts we define gt as uh, pts just just uh, integral of uh, ptx dx right this is like very simple uh, and we can try to take derivative of this, uh, this uh, PTS or take GT, DGT will be, now you see the random linear part appear. This is because uh, we had uh, proved something like this is a martingale, right? So, uh, yeah. 
So then, yeah, the same, you, when you take derivative, this DPT appear, the random linear part appear, okay? And then uh, this is a stochastic process. This, this thing is not equals to zero. It's not equals zero, but yeah. Uh, because of like you are integrating over a subset S, which where we don't know what really it really is, and to control the variation like of this uh, GT, you will look at this quadratic variation. The quadratic variation, you can see that uh, it's like the square of this this vector, and you can see that um, when you try to apply some kind of Cauchy Schwarz inequality, you can bond this quantity by the covariance matrix. Like spectral norm of the covariant matrix of A. So uh, to control this uh, PTS at time t, uh, yeah, everything boils down just to control the spectral norm of the covariance matrix at time t. Okay. Any questions? Okay, and in addition, if you can upper bound AT by one over capital T for all time up to time T, meaning that uh, this is like, yeah, this, this norm of AT is less than one over T, then if you integrate this so norm of AT uh, from zero to T, then it's less than one. Um, Less than one, this quadratic version is of constant order, then this PTS will be of a constant order. And meaning that this, sorry, uh, this part will be controlled as constant. And only isoparametric function efficient is this, uh, this time T, how long, how long you can run it. So you will get T to the one half isoparametric coefficient using as L dense stochastic localization. Okay, so. The goal is to show like technically like the goal is very simple. You want to look at this uh, 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 covariance matrix at time t. You want to upper bound its uh, spectral norm by one over t, capital T. Hopefully you can take a capital T that is large enough of all the constant. If that is the case, then you will get all the constant isoparametric coefficient, okay. Any questions about this part? It's kind of, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that yeah, sorry, that, that part is like basically the whole idea in this L dance stochastic localization that you just need to control the spectral norm of A and you are done. And the rest problem is, uh, is just very technical. Uh, we will briefly discuss the, the main idea in our, so this kind of observation has been observed this has been observed in LDAN 2013 already, and also like uh, observed a lot in this Vili and Vampala 2017 paper, but the technical part will be different. And our contribution is mainly on the technical part. So I have to explain a little bit like how uh, we are doing things differently from a technical perspective. So you have this spectral norm A, it is, uh, yeah, x mu t, x minus mu t, transpose, uh, ptx dx. This is just covariance matrix at time t. Uh, and then you can take derivative of it because you want to control a spectral norm. Uh, you can see that uh, because uh, taking one derivative making appear a random linear part, uh, taking another derivative, you can see that you have third moment part that can appear here. And then you have uh, a drift term that is negative, which looks good. Uh, controlling the spectral norm directly of this, this AT is difficult. Uh, usually people use this kind of potential function. So you raise this uh, AT to the power Q and take the trace. And you know that this uh, trace of AT to the Q then to the one over Q, it's very close to the spectral norm of uh, AT, okay? And that's the idea. And then uh, Liam and Pala actually tried many Qs, so, but they, they had the, their, the one that has, they have success with is take Q equals to two and uh, control matrix CT equals to identity, then they get uh, isoparametric inequality of order one over 
n to the one quarter. Okay. Um, yeah, so Liam and Pala's use of LDAN stochastic localization is a, a special instance of this pathwise analysis where you apply stochastic localization with some identity matrix the covariance. So the, the covariance, uh, ident the control matrix identity, the Gaussian part increase linearly, and then you do some early stopping and you observe that the isoparametric coefficient for strongly locked concave density is very easy to prove. And then you want to relate back, say that the, 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 the isoparametric inequality for the original density can, can, can use some of the isoparametric inequality for the strongly log concave density, but you need to control this PTS uh, uh, at, at, for, for this stochastic process. Um, so it is a natural idea like to extend their, their, their paper, just taking a larger power here. Uh, like a t to the power q, and because you take a larger power, you get a better op approximation of the spectral norm of a. Uh, but the calculation just uh, becomes trickier. I think they, they also explore this this idea, but uh, there was some difficulty. Like you can try to take the derivative of this uh, trace of a t to the power q. Uh, you have some martingo part that is normal. That you have some negative part. And then you have a kind of uh, a third order tensor part, which is kind of for a long time, we don't have good ways to control it. Um, what, what is this roughly? Is this like you have your start with something a to the power q, but then when you take the derivative with respect to a, you will generate those kind of moment kind of parts that appear because derivative A has like third order moments. And this is like third order moments appear here. Okay. So this term looks difficult. And for Q equals to two, they have some good way, like smart ways to bond it, but for high Q is difficult. And so let's summarize what we really did in the 2020 paper. Um, we get a better control of the potential gamma t in two stages. Like the, uh, the first stage of the control that I think people in the literature already know about it, but the second stage of the control is like is slightly different as, as new. And um, the second idea here is actually we use a, a kind of bootstrap scheme that, uh, that was also original introduced uh, in some notes by Liam and Pala, but we kind of refine it. Uh, the bootstrap scheme says that if you know a lower bound for the isoparametric uh, coefficient of order uh, dimension to the power beta with, with, some, with some constant beta between zero and one half, then using the LDN localization scheme, you can improve this constant beta a, lot, a little bit. You can improve the dimension dependency from beta to beta minus beta over eight Q. Some, so the, here the Q is of order one over beta, then beta minus beta over eight Q is like beta minus uh, um, beta square. So each time you improve your, your dimension dependency a little bit by beta square, and you can see uh, you can iterate this process many times, starting with a constant beta, like one half. And, and if you work out this iteration, uh, you, can, you, can, you can see that why we get this weird n to the power uh, log, log, log n, log, log n over log n. It's the result of iterating this kind of uh, uh, recursive, like bootstrap, uh, bootstrapping this kind of uh, uh, recursive uh, uh, bonds, okay. So let's, uh, let's see how we actually control the, the potential function. Uh, this gamma t, recall that this is like just trace of a t to the power q. But now we, 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 have, we want to use uh, a larger q. And the interesting part is that the first part, we can rearrange the third order tensor terms by putting all the a t terms in the, in the first part. This you you only lose a little bit. That's yes. less than you have a martingo part. Then you have a ten, so the other tensor part. We simplify it to be only one one term, 
And the focus will be just trying to bond this term, one term. And yeah, so like we explained, you want to find the time t so that this uh, uh, potential function to the power one over q is bounded by one over t. Then your spectral norm is also bounded by one over t and then integral to constant so that pt part is controlled. So this uh, pts part one quarter to the quarter, and this thing is of order constant. Then uh, your idle parametric coefficient only depends on this t, like how long, how long you can run this uh, uh, stochastic localization process. Okay, so this, this potential function gamma t looks complicated, but uh, after all, it's some kind of uh, third order moments, right? Third order moments, but on the left-hand side, you have some moments that depends on the second order. The, the covariance is second order, right? Some second order function, but here you have third order functions. And the idea is like, you can relate the third order tensor with the second order functions of the second moment using Poincaré inequality, because when you try to apply Poincaré inequality, you basically take one derivative, you will shave off one of the degree, right? So the Poincaré inequality uh, will like the, will help you bond this term. So this is kind of this kind of uh, loop that is happening. The, uh, if you have a KOS constant, uh, you apply Chigas inequality, you get uh, Poincaré constant. And Poincaré constant, you get one, and you can apply it to this third order tensor to bond it. And then in the stochastic localization, you have a control of this potential once you get control of this third order moment. And then you get a new KOS constant. This is really kind of happening in this, uh, in this kind of bootstrap scheme. And the thing is that this, this scheme, I think many people in the lecture know it before, but it's just this, uh, you, to make this uh, loop like tight or like every time you improve a little bit, it's difficult. And we have actually a, a, a better control of this potential. Um, the key idea is that uh, you have a two stage of control. In the first stage, uh, the Poincaré constant is just bounded using the original isoparametric constant that uh, uh, is start, you start with some, you start with some log concave density, you have isoparametric constant and you use that to bond the point chemically. But the key observation is that if you run the stochastic localization, you actually add a little bit Gaussian part to it. So you not only have the original isoparametric constant, but you add some Gaussian part to it. And once you add the Gaussian part to it, you should have a better Poincaré constant there. And then the second stage of the control, you should get slightly better than just using the original isoparametric constant there. And we get this, so this part is new and it's just the, the addition of this part make the whole kind of bootstrap scheme works much better and we get better bound. And let's try to work out a little bit like math, but you don't have to follow all the steps if it's too getting too complicated. So the, you get the differential equation for d gamma t and you have a third order tensor part. The third order tensor part, why it is of this form is it's basically, it's roughly like, it's, sorry, it's roughly you have power a to the q minus two, but you have this third order moments appear. So that's why it's, it's roughly uh, like a to the power a plus one. And, and that's why it's roughly gamma to the one to the one over q. And here you use the original isoparametric constant that appeared here, like n to the power two beta isoparametric constant. On, in the second stage, actually, you bound things differently because now you know that you have enough Gaussian part that is being added. And if you have enough Gaussian part that is being added, you can bound the potential using this Martingo part. Then the third order tensor part, you can try to use the Gaussian part. This one over T is basically the isoparametric, like the Poincaré constant that comes out from the added Gaussian part. And then you only get gamma power here instead of this. And these two 
stochastic differential equation or like this bonds has slightly different characteristics. Um, like if you only know the first stage of the control, you start with some idle parametric coefficient with n to the power minus beta. You only know the first part of the control and you solve the stochastic differential equation and you can see that you can only bond, this is like spectral norm of AT is like n to the one, one minus Q is like roughly n to the uh, beta. So this, this, this spectral norm of AT can only bond it by n to the beta, meaning that you can only run to time one of order uh, uh, there's a two missing somewhere, but yeah, and and time or other n to the beta or n to the two beta. There's two missing, but yeah, but I think it's yeah maybe here it's um yeah so you can only run it to the n to the uh, beta I guess yeah and then oh no yeah two beta sorry yeah should be two beta but that is somewhere I think Q has a two on that maybe yeah uh, then the you get the same idle parameter you start with n to the beta but you get back the same idle parameter coefficient n to the minus beta but the situation is different if you can run the stochastic process for a little bit longer if you have the second stage of the control uh, you can run, you can show that you can still run it to time t2 equals to n to the beta over 4q, uh, where you can still bond the spectrum. On, this is like, yeah, this is like spectral norm of at roughly and up to one over t2. And now you can see that you run this a little bit longer. So at each application of this L dan stochastic localization in two stages, you get a little bit better idle parametric coefficient from beta to beta minus uh, beta over 8q, where q is just uh, yeah, of order uh, one over beta. Okay, that's so that will complete the, the, the flow kind of proof idea. And the key observation is that uh, you have a second stage of control and you can make take advantage of like you add some Gaussian particle to your density and you get better control. Okay, uh, any questions about this, this part? Then we'll get to the uh, applications and future directions. Okay. Um, so there are actually very interesting, this LDAN stochastic localization is not just to use the, for like, uh, Proving chaos conjecture or proving idle parametric coefficient, it seems like it's there's something common that like as long as you're dealing with high dimensional high dimensional objects, and as long as like you have some uh, convexity type of constraints, you can apply this L dan stochastic localization. This was also applied in this interesting like con convex analytic functions. I, I don't know much about it, but Clada has a paper in it, and then. There's also very recent um, application of this l dan stochastic localization to uh, uh, discrete distributions like these high dimensional easy models. Um, yeah. And for the improve the chaos bond, so we improve the chaos bond, the dimension dependency goes from n to the one fourth to uh, n to the little of one. So you get better concentration inequalities, you get better large deviation results, and you get a better concentration inequalities along a random direction. This Boas also explained a little bit. So the, basically the convexity constraint in high dimension is very similar to this type of independent constraint, like each dimension being independent kind of constraint uh, from, like from, from the bond. They're, they're not similar from the, uh, intuitive level, but from the bond, they look like very similar. Um, and actually, uh, I'm not, I'm really a beginner in this uh, geometric analysis, and I actually work more on this MCMC -MC sampling theory, and this has kind of important implications when you deal with this MCMC -MC sampling theory, and I will talk a little bit about it. Um, so there's kind of interesting uh, problem in uh, in the theoretical computer science literature is 
you still have some kind of convex body and you want to compute its volume. And it's not, it's like, it's not, uh, it's usually an MP hard problem to compute this volume exactly in a high dimensional setting, but it's possible to approximately compute this volume using some type of sampling algorithms. And the state of the art of like this volume sampling algorithms uh, was introduced in Ja and Or and uh, Lee and Bampala and uh, Adit, Aditya, uh, yeah, Adia uh, in 2021. And they they use a sampling algorithm there at Bulwark and to, to get the approximate volume. You Once you have a sampling algorithm that makes in this convex object, you can get the volume estimation. They also make use of the chaos constant. You can see the bond, the chaos constant appears in the bond. So if you kind of appear, you kind of, if you improve the chaos constant, you improve this type of volume computation algorithm uh, bonds. Um, another thing I work a lot is this uh, log concave sampling. Like you want to start this, the, like the uh, Bayesian kind of computational method, like sampling method. Uh, on a very uh, simple like target distribution that is log concave. And typically you will see this isoparametric constant appears in a key quantity in the mixing time bond. So if you improve this uh, KOS constant, you improve those mixing bond for this uh, log concave sampling problems. And in some situ situations, the, the, it gives you kind of funny intuitions uh, like the, if the chaos conjecture is true, it's there's like practically kind of seems like you don't need to design very sophisticated algorithms. Uh, for example, for uniform sampling on polytopes. And this is some problem I worked on during my PhD is that you have some kind of polytope specified by linear equation AX, S and B. So here is an example, you have five constraints dimension two and you want to sample uniformly from this, uh, this, this polytope because uh, uh, in some applications, uh, you don't just need a, a, a linear uh, programming solution. You want to diversify your solution a little bit. You want to sample from it. And the interesting thing here is if the polytope is in some isotropic position, you can run this ball work. It's just a simple random work where each proposal is just a ball and you use metropolitan hasting on top of it. The mixing time of this ball work is just n square divided by isotropic uh, log isotropic uh, this uh, KOS constant. So assume it's of order constant of order of order one, then it's of order n square mixing uh, mixing time. And per iteration cost of ball work is very small. It's just m times n. But in the literature, there are also people designing very complicated. Uh, random works where the proposal at each step is no longer just a ball, but some kind of ellipsoid. And the intuition is you need to adapt uh, to this kind of sharp corners of those uh, uh, those uh, poly uh, polytopes. And then you, it's it's advantageous to have designed this proposal to be ellipsoid because uh, you can go faster in certain direction when the when the angle is like very sharp. But so people prove bonds, poor mixing time bonds. You can see that the mixing time bonds sometimes can be, be better than the mixing time bond for, for ball work. But the overall cost will be large because at each iteration, when you try to get the ellipsoid kind of uh, proposals, uh, you are, have to solve a linear system instead of like checking a linear system. The per iteration cost will depend on this matrix multiplication constant where it is like, uh, is larger than 2.3. Uh, and you can see the presentation cost is larger than ball work. Uh, even if you improve a little here, you kind of still lose in those presentation costs, meaning that uh, looking at those current state bonds, they're not like tight bonds yet, they are upper bonds, but looking at those bonds seems like in for those high dimensional polytopes, if they are in isotropic position, uh, then you need don't need a very sophisticated algorithm to adapt, adapt to those angles, like small corners of those the polytopes. You just need to apply simple kind of ball work as, where the proposal is isotropic Gaussian, which is kind of interesting intuition. But but we are not at the end of the story yet, but all these bonds are just upper bonds. They're not known to be tight. And the best rate 
as co people conjecture to be much lower than this rate and it's still open. Um, okay, so yeah, there are a few future directions. Uh, uh, currently we have a bond that is of order like n log log n over log n to the one half. It looks like a very weird bond. It's a natural question to ask whether we can improve it. Um, more importantly, like even if we like, even though we applied Eldan stochastic localization scheme, it's not clear we reached the full potential of the scheme because uh, I have to say that uh, this is a complicated stochastic differential equation. Uh, we can control some of the terms, but most of the terms, uh, uh, I don't know how to control this stochastic differential equation. And maybe if you know better control of this stochastic differential equation, and you can choose a better control matrix, or you can modify the process a little bit, and you might also get better bond, but we don't know. Um, so there are also like new applications of this advanced stochastic localization scheme or this pathwise analysis schemes uh, in other high dimensional ph phenomena. I think uh, in the lecture two or like the lecture before, people yeah, already mentioned that you might have some kind of discrete version of the KLS conjecture that uh, is uh, worth understanding. And that's it for my talk today. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yusin, uh, for the excellent lecture. Uh, now it's time for questions. May I ask a question? Um, um, I have a very naive question. So, so um, in, I don't know anything about sampling theory. So, so what kind of local cave distributions are, are, would you like to sample from? Um, is it part of optimization theory in a linear programming or how, how, what's, the, what's the story? Uh, yeah, so in, in, a, in a simple setting, you just have this type of like, uh, Bayesian kind of logistic regression. So will be some kind of log of like uh, 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 some data function uh, in, in, inside. And it's like, when you look at the Bayesian logistic regression function, it is like very simple log concave function. And that's the kind of, yeah, like too simple. And when I explain to my colleagues in, in the department, I think that's all the two simple forms, log concave functions you, you want to sample from. Uh, they're also like the, the, the difficulty like you go to those kind of hierarchical models or like you go to this kind of mixture mod Gaussian mixture models. The Gaussian mixture model, if you look at the posterior, like try to estimate the datas, the posterior will also have kind of multi-model distribution. Those, those distribution already is not log on cave. Yeah. Or if you go to those kind of community detection problems, you try to uh, estimate uh, data, then it's still like, yeah, not a log concave distribution, but uh, yeah, we, we try to get some intuition from log concave distribution so that for each, uh, for each like uh, partition, like which is like close to log concave, you understand the behavior, but we are still very far from like, yeah, solving like many of the Bayesian optimization, like Bayesian sampling problems where you have multi-model structure. That's what I think is kind of interesting that you have you know, for those type of problem, you can probably have to combine this kind of discrete type of sampling problems and the, the continuous type of sampling problems. Like uh, if you want to jump from one mode to the other mode, you need those kind of discrete sampling algorithms to go from there to there. And then if you want to mix fast in one of the mode, then this log concave sampling kind of idea might be useful. They are not exactly log concave there, but they can probably be approximated by some log concave densities, yeah. Um, yeah, I have to say we are still like, we're in a very kind of naive stage. Like I talk to my colleagues and they always come up with like very complicated Bayesian <laughs> models where we have no idea it's like close to log concave or not. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, when you see going back to your key estimate, uh, then you have these three tensors and, and for some reason you add the Gaussian part and then you make the work. So maybe you can, of course it's technical, 
probably, you know, why this, uh, you know, how can you overcome uh, the complicate uh, this three tensor? And there might be some kind of cancellation or something there in three tensor or maybe relate to some sign. Then you, when you add the Gaussian part, then you can carry on your estimate. So what's the reason why you add Gaussian, then you can carry it through all those. There might be some reason behind it, right? Uh, yeah, so yeah, like I said, this, this three tensor part, you have basically this kind of third moment kind of part there. The, the key to bond this uh, three tensor is to basically, uh, uh, you want to relay something about third moment to the second moment, right? You want to go down like to the moment. And there are multiple ways to do it. Uh, like the way we, we try to apply is try to apply this Poincaré inequality where when you take derivative of a third order thing, you get a second, second order thing. And you can try to bond everything just using AT uh, on this hand, uh, this run right hand side, right? And um, when you try to apply Poincaré inequality, you can try to use, like, we can try to use that uh, the, the, it's, it's satisfied of isoparametric uh, inequality. The original data is satisfied of parametric inequality. We get some bond. But the, 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 the interesting thing is that, yeah, we kind of make use that we, uh, when you add the Gaussian part, your, your, your Poincaré inequality should be a little bit better at some time of T. Like, uh, uh, you, you don't just rely on the original isoparametric constant. You get a little bit more, like, a little bit more contraction and you get better bound on this retensor. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, so this 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 whole idea was rely on relying on this. You add the Gaussian part because once you add the Gaussian part, you should yeah intuitively you should have better control of everything because the Gaussian part like basically contracts things. I, I didn't show the video today, but I was showing a video like where you simulate this stochastic uh, L, L dense stochastic localization. You start with some uniform distribution and you basically add some kind of Gaussian part then the distribution becomes sharper and sharper. And, and intuitively, if you add this Gaussian part, you should be able to have better control, but technically, uh, yeah, the things has to be kind of worked out carefully. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. Suppose now you have a bounded, suppose a smooth convex domain in I then the first eigen function is log k uh, of the Laplace. So therefore, if you put this as your density, then you normalize. If anything better can be said, uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's a very good question. I yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know much about it actually. Yeah. Um, because the first second function, of course, uh, you can put as a particle inside domain, and this is a uh, log concave. And that log concavity is a crucial part of when so-called the proof of the fundamental gap theorem for the mm -hmm. first and the, and the difference of first and the second eigenvalues for the mm -hmm. direction problem for the convex domain. I see, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know much about this actually, yeah. Are there any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank you again uh, for the excellent lecture. And of course, all single boys and all uh, the four lectures, then we conclude uh, this year's series of Nuremberg's lectures in geometry analysis. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you.